Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Awesome. Well, welcome into another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. I'm excited for today's talk. We have, I always say on this show, we talk about the three-legged stool of business that is mind-body business. And we have a guest today who's going to help us with our body and our mind. And obviously that spills over into business, but we're talking about food. We're talking about how to stay healthy and how to just live a better life cleaner lifestyle with what you eat. I personally think this is a very, very important topic. It's something I dove into a number of years ago when I was feeling sluggish and and just slow. And I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it. I just yucky is the best way to describe how I felt uh, before I kind of stumbled upon this, this magic potion, if you will. So we're going to talk about how to stay healthy from the inside out. Uh, we have Ashley from Bella Foodie. So before we go any further, Ashley, I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about this, this conversation. So before we dive in, though, there's a billion different ways you could describe being an expert in the food niche. So can you just clarify what exactly you do? So I am a personal chef and food educator, or at least that's how I like to classify myself. I mostly focus on organic, seasonal, and local cooking because it's usually better for your health. That is in my opinion. I know a lot of people argue with me and they have all their own opinions, but it's also cheaper too if you stay with in-season things. So that is a little tip from me to you, considering that the grocery stores are extremely expensive right now. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Inflation is definitely not out of control or anything. So <laughs> No, no, I didn't buy five things at the grocery store and spend $60 the other day. Not at all. I'm glad it wasn't just me. Um, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. But I want to clarify something you said because you said local ingredients. Mm -hmm. Technically speaking, the grocery store is local to me. I don't think that's exactly what you meant, though. Well, you know what? <laughs> My grocery stores are really good about having stuff from local farms and local purveyors of things like cheese, milk, um, we have some local meats too that are sold in our stores. There's even a local grocery store that has like a bunch of stuff from the farms and things and some bigger brands as well. Um, so I am a big believer in being taking part in all the farms in the area that you have. There's, I'm sure there's farmer's markets or farm stands in your area. And believe it or not, I live in a cold climate where we don't have farmer's markets year round like the West Coast but they do have farmer's markets in the winter too. Hmm, that's a cool little tip. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because every now and then we'll do an episode like this on health about eating eating locally or healthy. And no, lollipops in a bag, even though they're at the grocery <laughs> store, are not locally sourced, okay? So just <laughs> disclaimer on the episode. Um, so I, I'm obviously joking there, but all jokes aside, you, you must have had a reason to do this? What what got you into this path and exploring healthy eating and locally sourcing organic food? So I'm an Italian girl. And so food has always been a huge part of my family about celebrations, even just Sunday hanging out with the family. Like it's always around food. Um, even when we were little, my great grandmother had me and my cousins in the kitchen with them. But as I got older and I happened to get sick, and I really started to think about what food meant to my body and how did it function. Not to mention, like, when I was in college, I went to a college that focused on our mind, body, and spirit. And they meant that as a well-rounded person, we needed to think of all aspects of our being. I really took that to heart when I got sick. And it took a few years before people knew what was wrong with me. So I started trying to figure out how I could best support my body. So food was the natural aspect. And at 21, I was diagnosed with MS. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing like a, a diagnosis to force you into opening your eyes, first and foremost, mm -hmm. and then hopefully finding a solution. I think 
I think a lot of people just still walk blindly or they just put blinders on and like, okay, I have this. I'm going to do exactly what the doctors say, but it, it sounds like you took a, a, maybe a different path. Can you just explain that a little bit? Because I know MS is one of those things where there's maybe not a lot of education to the general public about what it is, but mm -hmm. what are the treatments? First of all, outside of food, like what did the medical professionals tell you were your options? Okay, so I've had a few different ones over the years because there isn't a one size fits all, but I take what they call a disease modifying therapy to help with my disease and to slow down the symptoms. Let me be clear, there is no like cure for MS. So any medications you see, any of those ads on TV, the only thing it does is to help our symptoms and to slow it down for us. I do believe in seeing doctors and being treated for your pain, for your symptoms, all that. I see a regular neurologist and I see a functional medicine doctor. And I take my health into my own hands by doing certain activities that are good for me and support my body. But food is one of the things I know I can control so that when things aren't good for me, I've at least supported my body and kept it healthy from the inside out. Mm, and that that's the thing that, so speaking as somebody with or autoimmune diseases, MS is not one of them, but um, no one ever talked to me about food. And I, I've watched family members go through diseases, whether they're autoimmune or not. No one ever brings up food. And for me personally, that's why I love talking about it on this show with experts like you, because it's the only thing I focus on in the quote unquote treatment of my own diseases, because it's the only thing that keeps me off of the drugs. I am relatively undrugged within, unless I absolutely need to take it. And I've treated a lot of my diseases solely with food. So mm -hmm. I, even if you don't have diseases, the reason I bring experts like Ashley on this show, and we talk about this as it relates to business, is because if I didn't see this as a solution, a proactive solution to maintain your health and, and be a, an amazing entrepreneur and business owner, you're missing the boat, first of all. But if I didn't see that as a solution, I wouldn't have it on the show. That's the power of this. And that's why I have conversations like this, Ashley. So thank you for being here, um, first and foremost. But tell me, what is what is the process to get started down this path? Because a lot of people, when they, when they hear this conversation, they go right to, A, it's expensive, um, which is not true. But that's the first thought, the first mm -hmm. myth. And then it's complicated and it's going to take a lot of time and I can't figure this stuff out. So where do you start with people? Well, when I am hired sometimes by clients who are just got a newly diagnosis thing where the grocery store starts to be a very confusing place for them. You know, you have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you have something or you just are trying to recover from a surgery or something and you need to eat a certain way. You stand in the grocery store and go, now what? Like, I don't understand. I tell people, read labels, buy the best produce you can afford. And believe it or not, your freezer section in your grocery store is a wonderful, wonderful place. They are flash frozen at the peak of freshness. So you can buy organic vegetables and fruit and keep them in your freezer and look for the store sales. And that is a good way to do it if you can't afford things. My farmer's market has what you call, I don't know, every state is different, but it's what we call like SNAP or WIC benefits here in Massachusetts. So anybody that is on like state benefits, they can go to the farmer's market and get fresh produce. And that's all organic and local. So if you can't buy organic, buy local. If you can't buy local, buy the best one you can afford. Mm. And just try to treat your body with the fresh ingredients. Processed, not so great. Yeah, I, I agree with that. <laughs> that's that's a good tip. If if nothing else, avoid the processed. Um, but so when you're, when you're experimenting with new foods, even I've, I've found that even if you're buying fresh produce, um, it, depending on what it is, it still may actually harm your body, depending on your situation, your disease, right. the way you react, whatever it is. So how do you go through the process of, of identifying what foods actually fuel you and what foods may be causing more harm to you, even if they're classified as 
quote unquote health foods? So like you need to understand your body and you have to understand how you work. Like for me and you, like I may be perfectly fine having more fruit in my life. Whereas for you, the certain sugars from certain fruits may make your body feel different. Like I need carbs because for my medication, like I can't be a live a carb free life. Like it just doesn't work for me, but it doesn't affect my weight negatively in any way. But some people, the minute they eat a carb, it has negative effects to their body because carbs convert to sugar in them, which is why people that are diabetic always have to watch like carbs and things like that. So it just depends on like if you're post anything, like I know I have friends that are post baby and they wanted to lose a little bit of the baby weight. You need to know if it's sugar that puts on the weight. You need to know if it's carbs. You need to know if you're drinking soda, which I'm sorry to all the soda companies out there, but I do, I do not like you. I am sorry. People don't look at the serving size on the back of those things. And those soda bottles are actually like two and a half servings. They're not one. The 12 ounce ones. Yeah. Are two and a half servings, not the liter ones. We mean the, yeah. the single serving ones are yeah. Almost three servings. Gatorades as well. The like Gatorades are the same way. And like people don't understand that. And that's just so bad for you. You're having like, a week's worth of sugar in like one sitting. <laughs> yeah, it's I, I laugh because it's true. When you look, when you go down this path and you start to open your eyes, it's it's a little scary because then you think, wow, I've done this to my body for how long? <laughs> like no no <laughs> wonder I feel like this. But it's it's definitely an eye-opening, crazy experience. Now, when you work with people on the food education side, mm -hmm. do you ever like how do you how do you start the process? I've heard of some people start it with a, a one or two day fast, or you you focus on only a couple ingredients for a few days to really isolate how your body feels. Do you have a, a process behind that at all? Well, at first I have to talk to the clients to see what's going on with them. And two, I try to start simple. Like we'll start with like a cooking class in their home. But I don't believe in any particular diet. I also don't believe in denying yourself unless there's a medical reason for it. Because I think the more we stigmatize stuff, like, no, can't have that. No, don't have that. Or this or that. Like, there's a lot of great health benefits to a little piece of dark chocolate. Like, I have little squares that I keep in the door of my fridge. My friends know this. They go in there when they come over to visit. <laughs> But it's good, high quality, non-dairy chocolate that is like made with cacao and not cocoa powder, which is the raw form. It's full of antioxidants. But I keep that in my fridge. A square or two of that at night after dinner, like when I feel like it needs something, it's totally wonderful. And that's not denying yourself anything. Or if you go out to dinner with friends and you want another glass of wine, go for it. Like I don't believe that we should deny ourselves everything if we're going down a healthy path. I also don't think we should beat ourselves up, but I still don't think you should have soda. That's my one thing. I'm like, please, please don't do that. Yeah, definitely no soda. Um, so to all of the soda companies who were thinking about sponsoring the show, uh, it's not for you. This show is not for you. I can't help you, but <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I you sorry if I lost you a sponsorship. I'm sorry. I, I really don't think you did. Um, it's it's going to be okay. <laughs> but all right. So that, that makes complete sense. And, and I'm on board with that. I would suggest uh, updating your stash location just so your friends don't steal your chocolate, but I'm okay with it. I'll share for you. <laughs> Sharing is caring. So yes. I love that. Um, so then in, in, when you're starting to work with people again, is there a way that you get people to understand maybe some of the, the really bad ingredients? I know we talked about soda processed food, but Noodles. how do you start to shop the right way? So I tell people, if you read the back of a label of something and one, it has a label this big of ingredients, no. And two, if it sounds like it should be in a cleaning product, <laughs> like, you know, like something that sounds way too chemically or like way too long, unless it is like something from another country, do not buy that. Like, <laughs> Oh, because typically that means it's some chemical derivative. It's something. If you want to, like, I have almond milk in my fridge. All it says is filtered water and almonds. That's Solid it. Solid ingredient list, yeah. That's it. <laughs> There's nothing else on the ingredients. 
That's what almond milk should say. That you shouldn't see 20 other ingredients on it. Like, that is my point when people start reading labels. You can have almond milk. Just make sure you buy the right one. Just make sure if you want to buy oatmeal, make sure you buy the oats. Not like a packet of oatmeal that has a bunch of different flavorings and things in it. Like, I just want to make sure that people do that. And there are some cereals. Like, I have some lovely cereal brands that are wonderful. You can eat them. You know, convenience is a thing. There's brands of chips I like. There's brands of things that are convenient snacks for your kids that are great that you can have in your life. But if it doesn't have ingredients that sound normal, no, just don't buy it. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, another one I've heard is the it's something like the 50 ingredient challenge, where if you look at what you eat on over the course of a normal day, if the number of ingredients in all of the products is more than 50, you might you might want to take a step back and, and look at what you're eating. But that's kind of scary when you think about it, because if you have yeah. if you have three meals a day, let's just say three meals a day, right? Three ingredients mm -hmm. per, per each meal. You could you could see how that could easily exceed 50 ingredients on a normal, the standard America diet, right? Like that's. Right, yeah. And I can see how people can get there, but ideally what's happening is at least two of those three meals is not going to be something of convenience. It's going to be something you made. Right. So if you're buying stuff that you're making out of fruits, vegetables, meats, seasonings, you shouldn't have extra ingredients in your life. Mm hmm I always yeah. tell my clients to start with meal prepping because it's the easiest thing. Find mm -hmm. something that you like that's super easy for you, or I give them a recipe or two that's super easy within their skill set. And it's things they can keep in their fridge or in their freezer. So that way when they come home from work, they can recombine it in some way, or they can take it for lunch in an easy way. And it's all wholesome ingredients. Mm, that's a good tip. And that, that leads me to my next question, which is, so the expensive, the difficult piece, I think we've, we've kind of established mm -hmm. that that's not always the case. But the next piece that I always hear is the, the time, you know, how, how long does it take to find recipes and then actually cook the meals? And Ashley said this to me off camera before we started recording, she is willing to travel the country and cook for you as your personal chef at, at whatever cost that may be. So I don't think that's a viable option for most people, but no. how, how do we make sure this doesn't take all of our time and we can still eat healthy? Meal prepping is awesome, but what are some other ways we can go about this? Well, one, I do do virtual lessons. So if you want that, you can always find me that way. And two, like, Easy things, like I tell people, when you come home from the grocery store, take an extra half hour and wash and prep some of the fruits and vegetables that you can ahead of time. Because if you see it in your fridge, you're more likely to reach for it. And two, like if you're just cooking dinner, like make some extra rice. Make a double batch of the chili or vegetable soup you made for dinner that night and freeze the other half. That way you have something healthy that you can take out one night when you're busy or extra pasta sauce. Like it doesn't have to make your life complicated, but just start making extra. And it may take you an extra five or 10 minutes of prep the night that you do it. But like you just now doubled your food of something healthy that you've made and you don't have to go through the process all over again. Yeah, that's that's a great tip. Unless you have kids. I learned that the hard way. They're, they're like, they have expanding stomachs. Help. <laughs> we so our kids we make a double portion and then yeah. there's less left over as if we only made one <laughs> i don't know how kids well, are. i guess it depends on how old they are because like yeah. i know teenagers will eat you out of house and home but if they're small get them in the kitchen even the teenagers make them help like even if it's a small act of stirring or putting things in a salad bowl for you or anything like that, the sooner you get your kids in the kitchen, the more likely they are to eat a well-balanced diet and be less picky. Yeah, I'm on board with that. And I think from a, from a leadership perspective, if you look at business, we want our kids to have good habits. And they, if they see you grabbing a, a protein bar or an energy shake, which however you want to label them healthy or not, they're, they're just not. 
um, if they see you doing that, then it's an acceptable behavior. So get them involved and, and show them, okay, we're going to take an extra five minutes to make breakfast. I have my four-year-old making eggs with me. He, he makes his own eggs now, which is uh, maybe maybe safe, maybe not safe. You can call Dyfus on me. That's okay. But he knows how to use a stove. He knows how to crack an egg. And it's, it's fantastic. He knows what a healthy well, meal so looks funny. like and how to make it. As long as you're watching, I'm like, I don't see anything wrong with that. If your four-year-old knows how to stir stuff and crack an egg and help, like, let him help you or let him help you make pancakes that are healthy or make a green smoothie with them. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely get your kids involved and just show them good practices, which, which I love. And again, you're raising future leaders when you do that. Yes. You're raising people who have good habits that they don't have to break later on. Um, so... Ashley, we got to wrap this up. This was an awesome episode and I, I love all your insights here, but how do we take the next step with you? I know you said you have virtual classes. Um, where can people go to find out more about you and your classes? Well, you can go to bellafoodie.net and you can find out how you can work with me. I can set up private personal chef classes with you or workshops virtually. Um, we also have a lot of recipes on our blog on the website and you can stay tuned for any of our workshops and you can follow us on Instagram at Bella Foodie 7. That's awesome. I was uh, unprepared for this episode, so I didn't put it on the screen, but I will put all of that in the show notes wherever you're watching or listening. Uh, thank you. First of all, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a minute of the ridiculous show that this is, but we have a good time. So Ashley, thank you for coming. This was awesome. You, the listeners, you heard her. Go in the show notes. Go click on the websites. Sign up for the virtual classes. Do what you got to do. Take that next step. And thank you for being a listener of this show and supporting me and Ashley and all the amazing guests we have. We'll see you on the next Harmonious at Lunch. Thanks for listening.